let's uh, let's talk some more about power series. And we have been talking about you know finding the power series of a function, right? And basically, we've only so far done really one example. One main example is this, right? 1 over 1 minus x. And the series for this is the sum n equals 0 to infinity x to the n, right? You can write it this way if you like. 1 plus x plus x squared. And this one, it has a radius of convergence. Here, the radius of convergence was 1. That is the interval of convergence around 0 is the interval minus 1 to 1, right? Uh, last time we did many other examples, but they were all sort of simple variations of this thing here, plugging in different values instead of the x, plugging in x over 2 or something like that, right? Um, Eventually, you know, our goal for the rest of the week is to talk about a general purpose method which you can use to find the power series of any function at all. And that, uh, actually, I think we're going to get to that today. Um, I wanted to do, um, so one last thing that we talked about just at the end last time but didn't do much with is that you can, if you want to, take the derivative of an entire series or the integral. So if you wanted to um, find another series. We did one example last time. If you take the derivative of this, you get a different function. Um, and that function, its series is given by the derivative of this series over here. I want to try one example like that, but doing integrals instead. And this is actually an important example. So let's find the series of 1 over 1 plus x, right? So this, just by doing simple tricks with the previous one, I use this formula here. Um, but instead of x, I'm using negative x to compensate for the fact that it's a plus in that denominator. So this, if you plug this business in, you get the sum minus x to the n. We did this example last time. Simple trick, right? And then this, uh, if you like, you can separate out the minus 1 part. Minus 1 to the n, x to the n. All right. So this is the series for 1 over 1 plus x. Um, this by itself is not terribly interesting, but we can get a, an interesting and important other example if we take the integral of this series. So if we do the integral, the antiderivative, It says, uh, so we can, on one hand, take the integral of the left side. The integral of 1 over 1 plus x dx. Anybody have a thought about this? How could you do this integral? We know a lot of tricks for doing integrals, although this one is not uh, terribly complicated. 1 over 1 plus x. If it was a x squared, then it would be like an arctangent or something, but it's just x here. Actually, this looks kind of like um, what you would get after doing partial fractions. Remember, we did when you do the partial fractions trick, you you end up with something like you know integral of after doing the hard part, you get something like this, right? Yeah. And then, how do you do the integral of each of those? Yeah, they, each of those things just becomes a natural log. So this, I mean, I'm just making this up here. This would be 3 ln x minus 2 plus 2 ln x plus 1, right? Now, in the example at hand, we actually just started at the end, really. So this really, it just is the natural log of 1 plus x, right? Uh, I'm going to erase this stuff down here. That thing up there, it is the natural log of 1 plus x. A plus C, of course, and that's something we do have to oops, we do have to worry about a little bit the plus C, but not not really a big deal. All right. So on the one hand, this thing right here, 
1 over 1 plus x, its integral is the natural log. But we can also take the integral of the series, and we will obtain a series for the natural log of 1 plus x, right? We can take the integral of the series. This is called term-by-term term integration. It's what, what we talked about at the end last time. What do you get when you take the integral of the series? So it's integral sum minus 1 to the n, x to the n. Ah, sorry. dx. And what is that? Well, the sum and the integral can uh, interchange positions. This is what uh, I wrote this like as a theorem before. You are allowed to integrate the series in each term. So this is the same as the sum, n equals 0 to infinity, integral minus 1 to the n, x to the n, dx. And then what is the integral of x to the n? It's just um, 1 over n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1, right? And the minus 1 to the n is just a constant, so that will stay like it is. So I end up with sum, n equals 0 to infinity, minus 1, I'll write it this way, minus 1 to the n over n plus 1, x to the power n plus 1. Right? And then I have to put a plus c. Now, the, it's only one constant. It's not like infinitely many constants, so uh, I'll write it this way. The plus c is not part of the sum. It's just uh, one single constant. All right. So put it all together. This integral of the series must be the same as the integral of the function that you see at the top. So we can conclude the natural log of 1 plus x equals the series with, with some constant plus this series minus 1 to the n over n plus 1 x to the n plus 1. All right, and this is a series for the natural log. Now, what about that c? Actually, we can find the constant c. What is the c? Uh, you know, when you just do an integral ordinarily, there's no way to determine the c. The c could be any constant. It's not, it's not the case in, in an example like this. You can find the c by plugging a specific value of x for which you know the answer. And in this case, we can plug in x equals 0. Then the left-hand side says natural log 1 plus 0, and the right side says c plus the series. But if I plug x equals 0, what do you get from the series? It's all 0, right? Everything in this series is some stuff times x to some power. And if you use the power, or if you use x equals 0, then that whole stuff is all zero. So this is just going to say c plus zero. Uh, and this will allow us to compute the c, right? What is um, the left side says? So the natural log of one equals c. And the natural log of one, anybody remember this? Another basic fact about the log. It is 0. Yeah, the natural log of 1 is 0. This is because e to the power 0 equals 1. So the natural log of 1 is 0. So that means c is 0. All right? Wait, here's my question for you. Yes. Why, why isn't there a c on the left side of ln 1.0? Yeah, so this is a good question. You may notice up here I wrote ln plus c, and I also put the plus c over here, right? Those two c's are actually, they're really two different c's because they come from doing two different integrals. And so what you have is just some constant on the left side and also some other constant on the right side. You can subtract them, which is move those constants over to one side. And the effect is you have some constant on this side, right? So yeah, I did a little, a little funny business, I guess. I didn't mention the fact that Really, there are extra constants on both sides, but you can always move the one over to the other side and co condense them into one extra constant. Good question. Anyway, the, uh, the conclusion is, so this is another important series. Natural log 1 plus x is the sum minus 1 to the n over n plus 1, x to the n plus 1. 
And what's the, uh, the radius of convergence here? So, uh, well, let me, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, this is the series for ln of 1 plus x, right? Um, this is important. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, like I said, we're going to be talking eventually about the series for just any function, all your favorite functions. We'll talk about the series for them. I don't know about all of them, but... Um, series for all the functions. Wouldn't it be better if, um, if we had... Um, Would we like a series for just ln of x? I mean, that's a, that's a more ordinary way of writing the natural log function. Why would you um, use a series for ln of 1 plus x? Why not just ln of x? Actually, there's a problem with, with that. Uh, a series for ln of x, this would be um, centered at zero. Remember, a power series has sort of a center to it. If I'm using just x as the variable, that would be, the series would be centered at x. Whereas if I use this, um, uh, can I, I'm going to say this a little bit differently, sorry. Uh, what I'm saying is not wrong, but um, the reason is because the, um, after all, this, this is a series centered at zero because the x here uh, looks like just x rather than x minus a, right? This is the difference between a power series centered at zero versus centered somewhere else. Um, the, the issue is because right here, I could, if I wanted to, plug in x equals zero, and it would give me the natural log of one. And this has some certain convergence um, around values uh, which would be close to the natural log of one. The reason you can't really do the same thing for ln of x is because um, this won't work for plugging in x equals 0. That's really the problem. Um, a series for the natural log of x cannot exist that's centered around 0 because the natural log of 0 is not, is not a thing, right? ln of 0 does not exist. All right, there's no way to draw the graph of the natural log. It looks like this, right? ln of x. And um, you can't make a series that is centered around 0 for that function because n that function does not exist at 0, and so it, it's not possible that that series would converge at 0. All right? Whereas ln of x plus 1 is actually um, moved over. So this has like an asymptote right there ln of x plus 1 will be moved over to the left. And now this one does make sense to have a series at 0. So this ln of x has no series at 0. But this one does. That's why. And so the, uh, the, sort of the short version of all that is um, there is no series for ln of x that's centered at 0. Um, the best you can do is ln of 1 plus x centered at 0. Or sometimes people do the series for ln of x centered at 1. You can do that. But you can't do ln of x centered at 0. All right? This is as good as it gets in terms of a series for the natural log of x. Any thoughts about that? I got one more similar one, and then we're going to talk about the sort of general method to do the series for any function which is super important. Um, one more. I would like to try this. This is also a, a nice, nice example to integrate because this function is the, um, is the uh, well, the integral of this is the arctangent, as somebody mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Um, so uh, this, let me just say, um, the integral is... Uh, tan, I'll write arc tan like this. So we can get a series for the arc tangent. By integrating the series for this thing, 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay. 
right? Let's see if we can do it. So first of all, we need to find a series for 1 over 1 plus x squared. This you think of as 1 over 1 minus negative x squared, like that. And then you plug into the series for 1 over 1 minus x. You plug in using negative x squared instead of x. This is very much like all the examples we did last time. We get... Uh, the sum, n equals 0 to infinity, it's going to be minus x squared to the power n, right? You take the ordinary sum of the geometric series, and but instead of x, we're using negative x squared. So to sort of simplify a little bit, it would be minus 1 to the n, x to the power 2n, right? The minus sign, I split apart from the x squared part. Okay, this is the series. I'm going to take an integral on both sides here. So we integrate. On the left side, we have the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared, which is the inverse tangent of x. And on the right side, I get the integral of the series part, which I'll put the c on the right side again. And then I get integral, or the sum, n equals 0 to infinity, and I'm taking the integral of this thing. All right, when we take the integral on the left side, we get the arctan. That's the integral of this. And then when I take the integral on the right side, I get, you know, whatever we get. What is the integral of minus 1 to the n, x to the 2n? Well, the minus 1 to the n stays like it is as a coefficient. And then what's the integral x to the 2n? It's going to be 1 over 2n plus 1, x to the 2n plus 1. And this is the series for arc tangent. Although, just like before, we should uh, figure out what the C is. And in order to find the C, we plug in a particular value, which we can compute on both sides. Yeah. Uh, it's just minus 1 to the n, because when I do the integral here, the variable if, of this integral I didn't even write it. It's dx, right? Um, so x is the variable. The n's we regard just like a constant. And so minus 1 to the n should not change. You know that minus 1 to the n, it's either a plus 1 or a negative 1. And it'll just stay as a sign. Whatever sign it is, it stays like it is when you take the integral. All right. Okay, anyway, uh, solve for the C, right? we got to plug in some value which we can compute on both sides, and usually it's going to be 0 because the series will all disappear when you plug in 0. So I'm going to plug x equals 0. The left side said arctan 0 equals C plus, and then the whole series becomes 0 when you plug x equals 0 into that. So C is whatever the arctan of 0 is, uh, and what is the arctan of 0? That means what is the angle which gives you the tangent of some angle equals zero? Uh, yeah, it is zero. You, I mean, your guess should be maybe zero, maybe pi over two, something like that. It, it's zero. The tangent of zero is zero. That's because tan is sine over cosine. Tan of zero will be sine of zero divided by cosine of zero, which is zero. So, the left side, arctan of 0, actually is 0. So this says 0 equals C. So that C is 0, and I'll just write it again. So the arctan of X has a series. It is what it says up there, but the C is 0, so don't write the C. Sum N equals 0 to infinity. Minus 1 to the N, 1 over 2N plus 1 x to the power 2n plus 1. This is the series for the arctan. It is obtainable by doing simple tricks, taking the integral of the series for 1 over 1 plus x. Uh, if you wanted to write out a few terms here, just because I like seeing them sometimes, when I use x, uh, n equals 0 is the first one. The sign will be positive. That fraction will say 1 over 1, so it's just a 1. And then it'll say x to the power one. So we begin with one, uh, just x. And then the next one will say minus 
when n equals 1, you get 3s for those. 2n plus 1 will be 3, so it'll say 1 over 3, x to the 3. The next one will be a plus, 1 over 5, x to the 5. So what you have here are uh, odd exponents and fractions, 1 over whatever, and alternating signs. All right. Arctan x is that. I don't know. Uh, would you mind me uh, getting a little philosophical here? This, if you've never seen this before, um, one appropriate response to this, I know you can get sort of bogged down in the details doing one example after another, but um, sometimes it's a good idea to step back and, and take a look and uh, I would invite you to consider how crazy this is that the arc tangent uh, is actually equal to that thing on the right hand side. You know, the arc tangent is something that we get from trigonometry. Um, arc tan of x, it means what is the angle whose tangent equals x? The angle in radians, of course. And for some, some ridiculous reason, that angle can be computed by the formula on the right hand side, which is you start with x. You subtract one-third x cubed, then add one-fifth x to the five. This is like a some kind of some kind of silly uh, pattern in the things here. That it, this is like some kid would would come up with this weird pattern and think that they did something cute, and they did do something cute. And I would say that's cute, kid. But for some ridiculous uh, reasons, this turns out to be a formula for the arctangent of x, which. Um, I would, I would just say there is no real, there's no good reason why this should be true, but it, it, it simply is true. Um, I hope you know what I mean when I say no good reason. I mean, there is a reason. We just showed why it's true. So there is a reason why it's true, but it's, um, it's kind of ridiculous in my opinion. Um, the fact that such, such kinds of things are true is a, is a deeply strange uh, fact in my opinion. All right, he didn't like my philosophizing. Okay, so we have seen so far, we have um, series for uh, these functions. I'm going to try and write this uh, and variations of that. Well, we also saw the series for the natural log 1 plus x, and we also saw the series for inverse tan of x, right? That's it, though. These are the only functions which we have found the series for. I mean, you could, you could do other, like, integrals of these series. You could find the series for the integral of arctan x, although I don't even know what the integral of arctan x is. That's some, some other weird function. It's not terribly interesting. Um, what I want to talk about for the rest of today is... Sorry, I just realized my... My iPad clock is totally wrong. The one in here is right. Um, my clock says 940. I feel like we've been going for more than 10 minutes. So. Uh, what about other functions? Okay, actually, there is a general method to find the series for any function. Oh, can I just say, sorry, I, I meant to say this before. All of these have the radius of convergence equal to 1. Um, this is because they're all based on that first one. This one we demonstrated has a radius of convergence equal to 1 using the ratio test. The other two are obtained by doing integrals and derivatives of that formula. And... Um, Part of the, what we said last time about when you take the integral of a series, the resulting series has the same uh, radius of convergence. And so all of those series, they converge when x is within one unit of, uh, of zero. Okay, uh, anyway, there is a general method to find the series for any function. It's actually not, not true of any function. It's any differentiable function. So find this method, which we are about to describe. It requires that you have to um, take the derivative of your function. And actually, you have to be able to take the derivative over and over again. So there has to be 
there has to be a first derivative and a second derivative and, and so on. Uh, but basically every function we ever talk about does have derivatives. You can take the derivative over and over again. You know, some functions don't have derivatives, but those are, those are weird examples that we're not going to get into. So there's a general method. This is called the Taylor series, named after some person named Taylor. The Taylor series is a general method that you can use to find the series for any function. And what I would like to do eventually is take all of our favorite functions and find the series. And you will see, actually, you get, like, as I was saying before, this formula for the arctangent is kind of a cutesy pattern on the right side. It turns out all your favorite math functions, sine, cosine, e to the x, they all have sort of cutesy formulas like this as a power series. When this was discovered, I imagine the people who discovered this were kind of dumbfounded by this like hidden cutesy way of writing every function. Um, we didn't create these functions so that they would have these cute formulas, but they turn out to have them anyway. Um, there's a deep mystery to that. You know, mathematicians often like to philosophize about the basic question of is mathematics, when, when we human beings do mathematics, are we um, creating something or discovering something? Like these facts about mathematics, are they, um, are they basic facts about the universe, kind of like the laws of physics, which we human beings have nothing to do with them, we just we learn about them, we discover them? Or are mathematical facts um, objects that human beings have created um, because, I mean, we invented mathematics or in a, like in a historical sense, you know. We didn't invent the laws of physics, but we, we invented numbers and, and stuff like that. It's a strange philosophical question. If, if mathematics is entirely a human creation, you would not expect cute formulas like this to be true, which nobody, nobody invented the arctangent so that this would be true. This just turns out to be true. Um, nobody made that. We, uh, there is a real sense in which we discovered it. But on the other hand, I mean, mathematicians feel, we feel like we're, we're making something. I don't know. It's a, uh, it's a weird question to ask, which doesn't really exist in the sciences. I think everybody kind of agrees that the sciences are discovered. They are not created by human beings. But mathematics feels different for some reason. Anyway, let's talk about this. So let's imagine... Say we have a function, just any old function, f of x, and we would like to determine the series. So we want to write f of x like a series. We want to write it like f of x equals, you know, some constant plus c1x plus c2x squared plus c3x cubed, etc. All right, we want to write it like this. Now, if you wanted to somehow figure out what that series is, really all that's necessary is you figure out what the constants are, right? That's the whole, that's the whole thing. If you can figure out what those c's are, then you, then you will have figured out what the series is. So we need to find the c0, c1, c2, etc. All right. So actually, the Taylor, the method behind the Taylor series, is it is a method for determining what those constants are. Okay, let's just talk about them one by one. So C0 is the easiest. If you know what the function f of x is, remember the idea is you have some specific function in mind that you're trying to find the series for. So if you know what f of x is, can you find what C0 is, the first term there? Uh, how could you find C0? Well, this is something we, we just did in these other two examples. You plug some particular number in, and if you plug the number 0 in, then everything works out great on the right side. So we can plug in 0. On the left side, of course, we get f of 0. And on the right side, we get C0 plus, you know, c1 times 0, because I'm plugging x equals 0, plus c2 times 0 squared, etc. All of those, everything in the dot, dot, dot there is 0. And so this just says 
f of 0 equals c0. Okay? So if your job is to figure out what each of those constants is, this you did it for c0. All right, I'm going to sort of write this over on the side. c0 is f of 0. That's it. All right? That's the easy one. How can we find the other ones? Well, what about, you know, what about c1? Well, to find the others, you take the derivatives. To find the others, take the derivative. I'll say derivatives. It turns out to find the first one, you take the derivative once. To find the second one, you're going to have to take the derivative twice, and so on. So anyway, where we started, I will just write the original thing again. I'm going to write out, I'm going to go all the way out to, um, well, I'll write the nth one here, just so that we can get a sense for what the, what the large-scale pattern is. So this says c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared plus dot, 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 and then eventually we get to cn x to the n. Okay, to take the derivative here, I'm going to take the derivative f prime of x. When you take the derivative on the right-hand side, first of all, c0, that constant goes away because I took the derivative. c1x becomes just c1, right? Because the derivative of a constant times x is just whatever the constant is. c2x squared becomes 2c2x, right? In here, you do the thing with the exponent. Take the derivative. The 2 comes down in front, and then the 2 decreases by 1 and becomes x to the 1. And then the next one, I didn't write it up there, but what would the next one look like? The next one, it used to say th c3x to the 3. What's it going to be? Yeah, 3c3x to the 2. Great. Etc. All the way down to the, the nth one, Oops. we'll say ncn x to the n minus 1. Right? This is what it looks like after you take the derivative. And now, what, do we, what happens if I plug in 0 now? Actually, then it tells me what c1 is, because all that other stuff on the right side will disappear. So I again plug x equals 0. What do we get? The left side will say f prime of 0. The right side says c1 plus a bunch of zeros. And so that's what c1 is. c1 is f prime of 0, isn't it? c1 is f prime of 0. Great. So you see where this is going? c0 is f of 0. c1 is f prime of 0. All right? About c2? Keep, keep going. Do, do the same thing. So I'm going to take the derivative again for c2. All right? Uh, I'm going to try and keep f prime on screen on the top. What is... So I'll just say... Again, take the derivative again. Starting here, f prime of x, I'm going to take the derivative again. Uh, this will be f double prime of x on the left side. And then on the right, we take the derivative of all that stuff. c1 goes away. 2c2x becomes just 2c2. 3c3x becomes... What is that going to be? Sorry. 3c3x squared. Yeah. 6 c Yeah. It's hard to say. 6, 3. That's how tall I used to be. 6c3x. All right. Plus dot, dot, dot. That, that nth term in the end, which is hard to see on the screen right now, ncnx to the n minus 1. That n minus 1 comes down. Uh, so what I'll see on the front is n times n minus 1 times cnx to the n minus 2. All right. Okay, anyway, what happens when I plug in 0 this time? Plug 0, I get f double prime 0 equals 2c2. And solving for c2, I divide the 2. It says c2 is 1 half f double prime of 0. 
Is that what you expected? I don't know if that's what you expected. Uh, let me just recap. Uh, I'll write over in the margin here. C0 was f of 0. C1 was f prime of 0. C2 is 1 half f double prime of 0. Can you see the pattern? I don't know. It involves f primes of zeros with something in front. It's not clear exactly what the pattern is. Can, uh, let's just try one more. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll see the pattern after doing one more. Again, what do we get? This time it is the third derivative. So I'm starting just above the, the gray bar there and taking the derivative once again. 2c2 goes away. 6c3x becomes just 6c3 plus some other stuff. I, I lost track of the next one. I mean, we could backtrack and, and figure out what the fourth one would have become after all these steps. Uh, I can say what the, that general term would be. It's n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 cn x to the n minus 3 this time. All right. Again, plugging in x equals 0, everything in the dot, dot, dot will become 0, and I just get 6c3. So f double prime, uh, f triple prime 0 is 6c3. So c3 is 1 sixth f triple prime of 0. All right, let me try and summarize. I, I mean, I already wrote them over in the, in the margin there. But anyway, c0 is f of 0. c1 is f prime of 0. C2 is 1 half f double prime of 0. C3 is 1 over 6. Now, if you recall, where, this, where did that 6 come from? It came from because this thing, before I started taking the derivatives, it was x to the 3. I took the derivative once, it became 3x squared. I took the derivative again, it became 6x. Um, and then the derivative one more time, and the x went away. But anyway, that 6, really, it came from 3 times 2. I'm going to write it that way. That 6 came from 3 times 2. And this gives you a hint about what, what would the next one have looked like. C4, if you do all that same stuff, this is one which begins as x to the 4. Then you take its derivative, becomes 4x cubed. Then the derivative again becomes 4 times 3 times x squared. If you keep on taking the derivatives, what you get is that. And then the fourth derivative of 0 there. Perhaps you can see the pattern here. Anybody want to... Yeah, the fifth one would be 5 factorial in that denominator there. So in general, I'm just going to skip to cn is 1 over n factorial f, the nth derivative, plugged in 0. All right, this is the formula for the general uh, constant in the, uh, in the series of f. Now, in order for this formula to work, it means when we saw this 1 half, actually this was 1 over 2 factorial, but... 2 factorial means 2 times 1, which is just 2, so no big deal. This one here has no coefficient in front of it, but that's 1 over 1 factorial. Um, it's a, it gets a little weird when you look at the first one there. C0, this formula, this works for every n if we use... Um, 0 factorial equals 1. So if you want this formula to work, sorry, I'm off the screen. Even for n equals 0, you have to, um, you have to uh, come to terms with the uh, sort of the convention that we consider 0 factorial to equal 1, so that that fraction in the front in term 0 it will be a 1. All right. This may seem a little weird, but 0 factorial otherwise doesn't really have a definition. You know, any number factorial means you multiply all the numbers starting from 1 up to that number. There are no numbers starting from 1 up to 0, so um, we, we just declare the factorial of 0 is 1. A little strange, but it's just we just say that in order for this formula to work for all values of n. All right? Excellent. So I'm going to, this is basically how you do the Taylor series. I'm going to say this um, this is for 
a series centered at zero. That is, remember what that means is it's, you know, powers of x that we're doing in the series. You can also do the same idea for a series that's centered at some other number. I'm just going to tell you what, what it works out. It's all the same business. You take the derivative over and over again. Um, if we do a series centered at, let's say, some number a, which means uh, our, in our series we use powers of x minus a, right? That's the difference between the centered at zero versus centered at some other number. If we do a series centered at a, we get the uh, constants. It ends up being this, 1 over n factorial f, the nth derivative, at a. So it's very similar. I don't know if I can fit both formulas on screen at the same time. The series centered at zero is 1 over n factorial, the nth derivative, at zero. This, the series centered at a, the constants, um, the coefficients are just 1 over n factorial, and then the series centered at, or the uh, derivative evaluated at a instead of 0. All right? Works out great. Uh, I'm going to summarize all of this. This is basically how you find the series. Um, I'm going to summarize this as a theorem. This is called Taylor's Theorem. Taylor's Theorem just says, Basically, the way you find the coefficients is by taking those derivatives. So it says if f is differentiable, a function, by which I mean differentiable like as many times as you want, you have to, yeah, that's how I spell it, you have to be able to take the derivative over and over again of this function. Uh, then, ah, sorry, the power series of f centered, I'm going to write it centered at a, is f of x equals c0 plus c1 x minus a plus c2 x minus a squared, etc. Where I will tell you how to find the constants. Cn is Sorry, 1 over n factorial, the nth derivative at a. All right? And this, when you um, find the power series by doing these derivatives over and over again, this is called the Taylor series. It is just the power series for the function, but we, we call it the Taylor series when... It's the power series that you get by taking derivatives over and over again. This is called the Taylor series of f of x, centered, centered at a, right? Um, usually, we're going to do this centered at 0, in which case it looks nicer. So let me just say, if it's centered at 0, it's really all the same stuff that I already wrote. This is not a new theorem. If it's centered at 0, then it looks like, like that a, everywhere you see a, is just 0. So it looks like f of x equals c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared, where the constants are cn equals 1 over n factorial f, the nth derivative, at 0. All right? And actually, there's a special name for this. The Taylor series um, you do for any uh, centered at any number. When you do the Taylor series at 0, there's another name for that. This is called the Maclaurin series. Maclaurin is another, another guy's name, another old white guy who didn't actually discover this. I mean, the Maclaurin, this is like, in my opinion, one of the lamest things named after a person in mathematics because the Taylor series is just straight up better. The Maclaurin is just what you get if you use A equals zero in the Taylor series. Um, 
some people don't even say this McLaurin, but in our book they call it the McLaurin series. All right? Um, and each of these, whenever we talk about a series for anything, we always talk about the radius of convergence. Uh, unfortunately, Taylor's theorem doesn't tell you the radius of convergence. So it's not like whenever you do this, the radius is always one or something like that. It, that's not true, unfortunately. You have to just find the radius of convergence yourself using the ratio test. So I will just say the radius of convergence... Um, you know, sometimes when you do this, the radius of convergence really is one. Sometimes it's something else. You, you just have to figure it out. The radius of convergence um, must be determined. And the way we are going to do it must be determined in each case. All right. And for our purposes in this class, we're going to use the ratio test. Although there are some examples in which the ratio test is not good enough to find the radius of convergence, but for, and so there are other fancier ways to do it, but for our purposes, we're going to use the ratio test. All right. So for uh, for a little uh, a little while, we are going to try to find the Taylor series for all our favorite functions, and I think we should start with one which is quite easy to do, and that is. Let's find the, uh, actually, the Maclaurin. Usually we're going to do the Maclaurin series for uh, e to the x. It turns out e to the x has a very nice Taylor series. <coughs> very nice Maclaurin series. And I think you'll see why immediately. You know, what makes the Taylor series difficult is you have to take the derivative over and over again to find those c's. Uh, but... Let me tell you something about e to the x. This is like one of the best functions ever if, if you're trying to take the derivative over and over again, right? Um, ah, sorry. Let's find the Maclaurin series for e to the x. So we need to find uh, these guys, right? This is the whole game, is figure out what the c's are. cn equals 1 over n factorial. The nth derivative plugged in with 0. So... Of course, the n factorial is just part of the formula. The hard part is finding the derivative, the nth derivative. But if our function is e to the x, then this is actually quite easy. So what is... Uh, I'm just going to write down the various functions. So f of x, this is like the, the before taking the derivative at all, just the original function is e to the x. So that means f of 0 is e to the 0, which is 1. So that's the first constant is f of 0, the 0th derivative, right, term 0 of the Taylor series, will just be 1. Uh, what about f prime of x? What's the derivative of e to the x? It is e to the x, yes. If you don't know anything about e to the x, hopefully that's, that's a thing you should know. Which means f prime of 0 is also e to the 0, which is also 1. What about f double prime of x? It is e to the x. You're going to get e to the x every time. This is why e to the x is such an easy example to find the Taylor series of, etc. right? The nth derivative, for most functions, this is much harder to take the nth derivative. But in the case of e to the x, it's just e to the x. And so the nth derivative of 0 is e to the 0, which is 1. All right, so generally, the cn is going to be 1 over n factorial, the nth derivative, plugged in 0. But this is just 1 over n factorial. That's it, because f, the nth derivative at 0, is 1. Sorry, I'm off the bottom. All right, so... Let's write our series then. So the series is uh, e to the x is, I mean, as a sum, it's the sum cn x to the n, n equals 0 to infinity. But this I can write as um, cn is 1 over n factorial. That's it. And so e to the x, we could write... Um, just to write a few terms, right? This is 1 over, well, the first term would be n equals 0. 1 over 0 factorial. Remember I said 0 factorial is 1. 
So the first term is just x to the 0, which is 1. The next term is 1 over 1 factorial x to the 1, 1 over 2 factorial x squared, 1 over 3 factorial x cubed, right? These are the terms of e to the x. Another cutesy formula, which turns out to be equal to an important function. 1 plus x plus a half x squared, 1 over 6, or 1 over 3 factorial. This is what e to the x equals. Pretty great, in my opinion. Strange but true formula for e to the x. This is the series for e to the x. Let's talk about the uh, radius of convergence, all right? Like I said, you have to just do this by hand. There's nothing about the derivatives or anything that you uh, want to look at. Um, radius of convergence, you got to do the ratio test. Remember the ratio test involves finding the limit L equals lim n goes to infinity of absolute value a n plus 1 divided by a n, right? Where those a's are the terms of the series. So I'm going to look, the a's in my case are this up here, 1 over n factorial x to the power n. And you got to take, take the whole thing, including the x's. That's what a n is. So when I do this, ratio test, it's going to say lim n goes to infinity. I have a big fraction, a n plus 1 will be 1 over n plus 1 factorial x to the n plus 1, and then a n is 1 over n factorial x to the n. Right? This is that thing, a n plus 1 over a n. <clears throat> and we got to simplify. Rearrange the fractions like we always do. The absolute value signs don't really matter here. The n, those factorials are all positive. The x itself might be positive or negative. So, as usually happens, I'm going to just sort of squeeze down those absolute values. They just can surround the x's because everything else in there is going to be positive. And I think once I rearrange my fractions, it'll look like n factorial over n plus 1 factorial times absolute value x to the n plus 1 over absolute value x to the n. All right? <clears throat> Those x's just stay where they were in the fraction. Those other things were in reciprocals, so I rearranged them. All right, simplify here. Can we cancel anything? Anybody remember? This is something that we saw a few times last time. n factorial over n plus 1 factorial. Yeah, there's like a one left over or something or other. Remember the top means uh, the product of every number up to n. The bottom is the product of every number up to n plus 1. Yeah, so what's going to be left over when we cancel here? Yeah, n plus 1 will be left over on the top or on the bottom? Yeah, on the bottom. We should When you have a bunch of things multiplied together, in this fraction... All the things on the top are also occurring on the bottom, except n plus 1 is on the bottom, but not on the top. So this is 1 over n plus 1. And then over there, I can subtract exponents, right? x to the n plus 1 divided by x to the n is just x to the 1 left over on the top. Just say like that. What do you say? What is this limit now when n goes to infinity? x is just some specific number, but the n is going to infinity. What do you say? This is 0. Yeah. I mean, it's you could say 0 times absolute value x, but that's 0. This is 0. So that L was 0 for any value of x. It doesn't matter what x was. You're going to get 0 as the L. Remember what the ratio test says? Uh, it converges as long as L is less than 1. But we just demonstrated that L is, L is less than 1, no matter what the x is, right? So L is less than 1 for any x. So the series converges. Yeah, 
the other way around. Yeah. The series converges for every x. All right? It does. It's the truth. Um, I hope that you will uh, maybe take this moment to start. Somewhere in your notes, you should have like a big list of um, series for various functions. And I'll tell you the, the important ones that I will expect you to, to know and have at immediate recall is, first of all, this one. It is 1 plus x plus x squared. This is the, the simplest one of all. All right, and the radius of convergence for that is 1. That is, it converges for all x with absolute value less than 1. Um, the arctangent one it, it is kind of cute, but not really all that important. Um, the, uh, the natural log is an important one, ln of 1 plus x. It is. Um, this one, I just said it's important, but I, I'm looking it back in my notes to make sure I don't mess it up. It's x minus 1 half x squared plus one-third x cubed. You alternate signs and put uh, 1 over n in front of each one. And this one also had radius of convergence equals 1. That's because we got this by taking the integral of the first one, basically, with, with some variation. Um, and when you do integrals or derivatives, it has the same radius of convergence. Okay? The next important one is this one, e to the x. It is 1 plus x plus 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed, etc. And this one, I'm going to say r equals infinity. That is, it always converges. This converges for every value of x. You can plug in x, and you will get the answer e to the x. All right? Uh, we are going to add more things into this list, although we probably won't get to them today, but just so that you'll be able to fill in the blanks. I want to do sine and cosine next time. So flip back to this page, and you'll be able to fill in those um, with their radius of convergences. All right. Actually, maybe we'll get started on sine today, although maybe, maybe not. Um, this, as I've, I've tried to uh, say a few times before, the discovery of these power series was kind of a, a revelation to people when, the, when these were discovered. Um, it was, uh, in terms of like the long span of mathematical history, it, it was fairly recent, like it, I'm, I'm talking about like the 17, 1800s, because um, these methods required you to do the derivative. So it was only after the invention and the development of the derivatives and integrals that people were able to figure out these formulas. But they immediately led to all kinds of new discoveries. Once you have this series, um, it becomes easier to do things with these functions. And one particular thing, which was immediately easier to do, uh, using the series, so the series for e to the x lets you compute the number e with much greater accuracy than you could without the series. Um, the original definition used for the number e was this. This we talked very briefly about, I think, for, I mentioned this like on one day. This was the original definition of the number e that was used by the people who first in, sort of invented the number e. Um, I believe the very first was, was a guy named Napier, who sort of simultaneously when he invented, Napier invented the logarithm, or discovered the logarithm, depending on your philosophical outlook. Um, and sort of at the same time realized that the number e would be important. Uh, in discussing logarithms. Um, this, though, was like Napier's definition of E, and this is very difficult to actually compute values of E. This is hard, hard to compute this number. Right? You could, the only way to compute the number E would be to just plug some big number for N, 
and say e, the number, is is got to be close to this number. You could say something like e is approximately equal to 1 plus 1 over 100 to the power 100, right? You could say that. Because e is equal to that limit, it means that if you use some big number for n, then e should be close to that, that answer. Now, 100 is not actually a terribly big uh, number to use for n if I'm trying to do this limit. But anyway, even so, this, how would you actually compute this? It involves 1 plus 100, 1 over 100. That's no problem. That's that, right? 1.01. .01. Actually, little known fact, Napier, the guy who invented logarithms, is also the first person to write a book which wrote numbers using a decimal point. It was, this was like in the, in the uh, early 1600s, 1620s. Um, he published a, uh, a book full of values of logarithms, in which he used decimal points. A lot of his digits were, his computations were wrong for a lot of them. But anyway, 1.01 to the power 100. This is very hard to do. If you really wanted to do this by hand, there's no better way than just multiply this number by itself 100 times, um, which you could do, if, you know, if you had to do it, you could do it. But this is hard by hand, right? There's some shortcuts. You wouldn't have to multiply by itself 100 times. You could do some, some cute business, like you could do 1.01 to the 50 times 1.01 to the 50, right? You could square, you could do 1.01 to the 50 and then square it. It would be easier than multiplying 100 times. Whatever. This is hard to do by hand, but once you have the series, and Euler was the first person to do this using the series, comparatively speaking, how hard is this to compute? The answer is not hard at all. 1 over, this is a 6, a 4 factorial, whatever that is. What I wrote x to the 6, I meant x to the 3. I'm trying to imagine you had to do this by hand. Um, how would you do this? To find the number e, we want to use x equal 1, right? And that says the number e is 1 plus 1 plus 1 half plus 1 sixth plus 1 over 4 factorial plus 1 over 5 factorial, etc. All right? And these numbers are much easier to compute than doing exponents of some weird number with a with a decimal. All right, this is a lot easier. Um, all you have to do is a bunch of tedious. So these fractions, you can compute all of them using long division. This is a pain, but not so bad, right? One over four factorial. Four factorial is twenty-four. You have to divide one by twenty-four using long division. You can. You could do that to 10 decimal places if you wanted to. It, it would, you wouldn't want to do this, but it would take you 10 minutes or so, maybe. And then just add these fractions together. Of course, you can't add infinitely many fractions together, but you go, you, go, uh, you know, seven or eight terms here. You get something that's very, very close to the, the true value of E. Anyway, uh, Euler did this. Oops. Euler computed in... Um, in the 1750s, uh, I wrote this down. Uh, 23 correct digits, decimal digits of E. Much easier using the series. That's all I'm trying to say. Um, and this is not the only thing. This uh, Computing digits of E is kind of obscure, but I'm, I'm just using this as an example of Cute things that you can do using series. There's a similar trick you can do um, to compute digits of pi using the series for um, the series for uh, arctangent, because there are certain values of arctangent equal angles like pi over four or pi over three. You can plug something into the series and get um, get a value for pi. Um, so this this whole like point of view of power series really changed the game as far as the kinds of things that people were, um, were able to compute back in those days. All right. I want to do sine and cosine next, but um, maybe, I know we got 10 more minutes, maybe I'll, we'll just start off next time doing those um, 
sines and cosines. If that's all right with everybody, that's all right with me. All right, see you then. Do that homework. Yes, I'll do it. I got 10 minutes. I'll do it right now. All right, so we will have class in person tomorrow. Sorry for my misdirection about the uh, Wednesday mornings. All right, see you all later. My, um, I don't fully understand the schedule. I, I take it day by day. My wife is more, much more on top of it. She tells me what to do and I do it. But uh, yeah, for some reason, the kids are going late, but my wife is not working tomorrow. I don't know. I don't have to understand it as long as it works out. All right, see you.